uh, sorry, next two weeks, we should be able to see that we will be lifting the curfew. Was that discussed in this cabinet today? Do you have support from your other colleagues? Because I know some of their constituents want the curfew gone. Well, let me say that I did not present that to cabinet today. It was something that I discussed uh, in the previous cabinet, but was asked to come with a comprehensive uh, document to cabinet, which I will be presenting next week. And so consultations has been having, we've been having consultation with the medical response team and others within the ministry. Uh, and that is one of the first things that we, we looked at. Um, of course, uh, as I would say, um, it has been two plus years that people have been battling with the curfew, up and down, um, time changes here and there. We are opening up our country slowly, but we must do it responsibly. And if the curfew has to go, it will also be upon us uh, as individuals to adhere to the regulation that remains. You know, so remember the wearing of masks doesn't stop at this point in time. The, 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 the fact that we need to keep our social distance. Um, so all of these things will continue to, 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 to be there with maybe CERN also easing up. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think it's high time that we they seriously look at uh, easing off with the core view. Uh, this is my personal position and at the same time many others within the medical response team. The lifting of the curfew will surely be welcoming news for Belizeans, but what happens if there is another spike of cases once the curfew ends? Minister Bernard says he is optimistic that the figures will remain low. We have seen a spike, even though we had curfew, uh, Hippolyto, so I don't think that really justifies whether the curfew or not does the case. When we were at the high level of the Omicron peak, we had curfew. Curfew was in full swing. Uh, we knew this was going to happen, the trend is going to happen, but for me I believe it's just uh, at the end of the day people are fatigued with the curfew and we need to ease off uh, some of these regulations. And, and so if the number of cases rises back, of course the, min the, the Ministry of Health or COVID response team will look at all possible angles where we need to curb the, 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 the spread. I'm optimistic however that we are looking at that spiraling down of, of COVID uh, we have to, at some point, start to understand we must live with COVID. And certain regulations that we have been able to put in place will have to be eased off slowly. And the curfew is one of them. It's going to be like a free-for-all if you lift up the curfew. Do you believe that's the way how Belizeans would interpret that? <laughs> I, 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 let me say, I think Belizeans have been doing that even with the curfew. And it's a fact. What we have to do is put the onus on the individual. The onus is on me on you, on all of us as Belizeans to do the right thing. And I think that is one of the messages we have been saying. We have enough vaccines in this country for people to be vaccinated, yet we are only 49.67% of our population that is fully vaccinated. So we have to insist and keep insisting that people get vaccinated. We must discipline. And I keep saying this, Hippolyto, you know why? Because if you go to Mexico or you go to Guatemala and they have their restrictions there, if they have certain restrictions, I best believe you that Belizeans who go over those places will follow exactly the guideline. So it is the same thing we are saying here. We have certain guidelines set out in this country that have COVID regulations. Whatever guidelines we have set during that time when we lift, if we do lift or or not, we need to abide by those regulations. So it is my responsibility, it is your responsibility to ensure that we protect ourselves and keep safe from, from and spreading, stop, keep reducing the spread of this virus, but also protecting our families and our, and our loved ones. The curfew was first effected when the Barrow administration had declared a state of emergency when COVID-19 was detected in Belize. The Ministry of Health and Wellness is also looking to update COVID-19 regulations at the land borders. Among those regulations is the high cost of the tests that Belizeans who have spent more than 24 hours across the border. There are many in the public who believe that the cost is too high, especially for a private company that is administering these tests. Minister Kevin Bernard confirmed that the Belize Diagnostic Center was awarded the contract by former Health Minister Michel Shabat. That contract, however, comes to an end in June, and according to Minister Bernard, negotiations are currently ongoing to reduce the cost of the PCR test. We ask Minister Bernard if he, personally, believes the cost is way too much for Belizeans to pay. Here is his response. 
I will just answer this that we are reviewing that with the providers. We are reviewing those issues. I will haste to comment on something that existed and an agreement on a contract with these people. But at the end of the day, Hippolyto, we are going to look at ways how we can ease the burden and even extend uh, the, the, the requirement for Belizeans going over and coming back uh, from possibly a 24-hour to a three-night stay. Those are all things that are in discussion and we are going to be discussing in terms of the, the rate uh, of what it's costing for Belizeans to test at, at these facilities. But $100 is still too expensive. $100 to a private company that we are told receive a contract months or before you took over the Ministry of Health and Wellness. I, I cannot speak to whether or months I believe that existed from the time they opened up the border for tourism. Um, but like, me tell, like I said, we are looking at ways how we can ease the burden and we are in discussion with the providers. That's one. Two, Belizean students traveling over to Guatemala and Mexico, they are being tested by the government of Belize. Free of cost, so we have also made that, and that took effect from, 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 from last, when we opened the border, we made that decision the following day. And so these are things that we are looking at um, in terms of making sure that it is affordable, it's accessible, and at the same time making sure that our Belizean students have access to the service. That contract comes to an end, I believe, in June. Will it be renewed? I cannot say that will be renewed or not. I believe that we are looking at all angles. We don't know where we're going to go with COVID at this point in time. Uh, again, we have to look at all of these. It is things that we are, going, we are sitting down and looking at. Uh, and as we start to live with COVID, many of these things may probably change. Yeah, but then would there be some sort of negotiations with the company to reduce the $100 that, that, that too much? Like I said, we are already in that discussion phase, even before the end of the contract, whenever it comes to an end. We are already in that discussion phase, and hopefully we can come to uh, a, 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 a right uh, or a more reduced, if that's what the, the view is, we are looking at that. the public one. And, and again, Hippolyto, I still go back though, that we have to also understand that while we, be, we are focusing on a figure, we also have to look at what all it, it entails. You're, you're an employer. One, you have people employed. We are creating employment. In fact, those people are creating employment. You, you look at all the, 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 the um, equipment, PPEs, and protective gears that they have to use as well. All these comes as part of a cost. I cannot speak for the, for the private company, but I'm saying that while we understand that, while I personally put myself in the Belizean people's shoe and say, yes, I agree, we may want to look at a reduction. We are in the phase of negotiating with the, with the providers and saying, what, what best can we offer to our Belizean people? What's the company's name that holds the contract? Well, we, I think it's obviously clear that uh, Belize Diagnostic is the one that has the contract at the border. Minister Bernard also stressed that a private company was given the contract because health officials in the ministry were stretched too thin. We cannot lose sight that in Belize, the government of Belize provides free testing for people here, and that is what we're doing. But yeah, but you can use that for travel outside. I understand that. But what I am saying, though, Hippolyto, is that we have to also look at the efficiency of, of the service. We have to also look at the manpower, the Ministry of Health. We are stretched thin. In fact, right now, at the all border points, at the western border, at the northern border, we have had to utilize our public health officers to be out there to ensure that we have a full, smooth sail, a smooth flow of, of, of people moving back and forth. Again, like I said, there have not been a, a, a vast movement of people uh, going across the border. Manageable. It has been working very fine over the past two weeks, and I think that that's going to be the trend. However, what that also does is that our public health officers, who are also responsible to look after malaria and dengue and all of these other things, are, uh, uh, and, 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 and food handling and, and, and inspection, are also limiting themselves in doing this type of work. So to, we, we, we have to look at the fine balance that we have to strike, uh, not overburden our staff who is already overburdened. Frontline workers are already overburdened. These, these public health officers are also part of the people going in the field doing swabbing and so forth. So, it, so if you look at it from that angle, from, from that whole picture, you'll understand why I believe that decision was made from the very beginning. 
As of today, visitors coming into Belize are mandated to acquire travel insurance. It is a regulation implemented by the Belize Tourism Board that was announced in January. The decision brought many doubts and resistance from tourism stakeholders, including the Belize Hotel Association. Our news team took a trip north to the Philip Goldson International Airport to see how the insurance process was going and how the tourists are reacting. We join reporter Vijay Alvarez for that story. Dozens of visitors lined up in front of this arrival gate at the PGIA today to purchase the BTB's most recent requirement to enter Belize, a travel insurance plan. The coverage is currently being provided by the Insurance Corporation of Belize and verified at the PGIA by the Immigration Department. And according to BTB Director Evan Tillett, the mandate is a part of BTB's effort to lessen the effects of COVID-19 on Belize's tourism industry. We feel that the insurance will provide us with a level of uh, protection and comfort, uh, peace of mind actually, uh, for both the guests, but also in terms of the, the trip cancellation part of the policy, it also protects the, the um, hotels uh, locally here in Belize. The insurance coverage comes at the cost of 18 U.S. dollars and provides coverage for up to 50,000 U.S. dollars in medical expenses related to treatment for COVID-19 for a period of 21 days, a plan that U.S. National Ed Sullivan says he was forced to buy into, but fortunately at a reasonable cost. I think I was forced to do it. It, did, it seemed like it, to me, it didn't seem like it was very expensive for the insurance it provided, uh, and we were able to buy it before we left here so we didn't have to wait in the line. Unlike that traveler, Dale Dion, a first-time visitor to the Jewel, says he was not able to procure the plan prior to his arrival, forcing him to wait in a long line that he says was rather frustrating. At first, I was very frustrated, very upset. Now, I had someone that told me about it at the previous airport, so I was kind of ready for it. The thing that was probably most frustrating was it just had to go from one place to another place to another place to another place. In the end, I'm okay with it, and I felt bad that I got frustrated because, I mean, I understand it. But just with all the COVID things, it, it could just be frustrating. The new mandate is among other requirements to enter the country, including a negative PCR test, a move that U.S. national Krista Shepard called an unnecessary expense that only adds to the cost of visiting the country. Most people that can afford to travel, first off, they'll have health insurance, but also um, I think it's an added expense and an added step we have to take. So it's hard enough. We already are going through a lot just to be able to travel. While Shepard was against the new protocol, her husband Ward says he was able to purchase the plan via the BTB's online portal, which was rather easy. But the fact that he had no other option did not sit right with him. I don't like the being forced to buy it, but I see um, it's offered and it's a decent price and it has good protection, it looks like. So I'm not really for it or against it, but it's not a horrible idea. And prior to arriving, were you informed about it prior to your arrival? Yeah, I bought it before I left this morning. And was that process easy? Uh, yeah, it's pretty easy. All in all, most of the visitors we spoke to today said the new requirement is rather affordable, useful, and important. But the purchasing process here in Belize needs a few tweaking. Reporting for Love News, I am Vijay Alvarez. Police Inspector David McCoy is flipping the script after his girlfriend reported that he was being abusive to her. We first brought you the story on Monday when McCoy was taken to court following a domestic disturbance over the weekend. Tonight, we can report that McCoy's girlfriend, 27-year-old Selena Francis, who filed the complaint against him, has been charged with common assault. This morning, Francis appeared unrepresented before newly appointed magistrate Johnson Clark, where she pleaded not guilty to one count of common assault. There was no objection to bail by the police prosecutor. As a result, Magistrate Johnson Clark granted Francis bail in the sum of $500 plus one surety of the same amount. The court ordered that Francis not interfere with the virtual complainant, David McCoy, or any of his family members, or any other prosecution witnesses while the case is before the court. In addition, the court ordered that Francis stay 100 yards from McCoy at all times. Francis acknowledged the court's decision and is due back in court on March 2, 2022. Minister of Local Government Oscar Kenya gave an update this today on the morning show surrounding the happenings at the Belmopan City Council. 
For some weeks now, the councillors have been expressing no confidence in Mayor Sharon Palacio. Things had escalated to the point where the mayor took to social media, referring to the councillors as Brutus and herself as Julius Caesar. Last Friday, a team of ministers met with the councillors, and according to Rekenia, the law allows him to intervene to a certain extent despite the mayor being an elected official. Representatives from local, local government have gone in, have, have had meetings with, um, you know, the mayor and the councillors. And certainly there is the need, you know, to bring all sides to the table. We have to work together. You know, they were elected to, you know, on a Monday to serve the people. And Ernesto, let me see, in any organization, you're always going to have challenges when you're dealing with people. True, but people some, come with varying, you know, perspectives, but somebody will varying have to, ideas. Somebody has to give. Absolutely. You know, somebody Absolutely. has to give, somebody has to see where, you know, more wrong was done or more right was done and balance it and make a compromise. But at the end of the day, authorities like yourself sometimes have to make a decision. Absolutely. And, and that's what I wanted to, to say that, you know, we have a responsibility, you know, as local government, we provide oversight you know, to all these municipalities. And we are going to do what we have to do because at the end of the day, we have to ensure that, you know, these municipalities, they were elected to serve our people and that is what they must do. So we are going to how much, apply the law where it is necessary. How much authority do you have, Minister, to change things? You know, I, I mean, like say a mayor is, mm -hmm. is not functioning, having issue with the councillors. How far can you go? Well, we are guided by the Town Council Act. You know, what does it say? What the Town Council Act? What the Town Council Act says is that, you know, there's, it clearly outlines what is the responsibility of the mayor, mm -hmm. the responsibility of the councillors, you know, how they carry out their day to day functions, and where, you know, they fail to carry out those duties. What is the responsibility of the Ministry of Local Government? You have, you have authority to remove if you can't even... I mean, well, I, what I can say here is, so for example... The mayor is elected. You, you, yes. know, you can't change that. But there are certain provisions provided in the law, for example, where, you know, if, you know, we find that, you know, the council is not operating in a manner that is, you know, financially viable, then we can go in and we can appoint, you know, a financial control you know, to oversee the work, mm -hmm. you know, and to report directly to the Ministry of Local Government. Works in the Toledo District in the sectors of agriculture and infrastructure have been ongoing through the collaboration with Area Representative Oscar Rikenia and the Ministries of Agriculture and Infrastructure Development. According to Minister Rikenia, residents in the South are seeing several industries rebounding. In the Toledo District, uh, we are seeing, you know, certainly cacao, you know, is beginning to pick up. You know, we recently saw that through the Toledo Cacao Growers Association, mm -hmm. there were exports, you know, to the United States, to Europe, um, certainly of, you know, raw beans, but also a couple months ago, for the first time, we actually saw, um, you know, the exportation of cacao nibs, which, you know, took it another step. That is a form of, you know, value adding. That's value of, adding, yes. Yeah, right, a uh -huh. form of, you know, processing. And certainly, you know, that fetches a better price on the world market. So that is significant, uh, you know, and we want to encourage our Cacao Growers Association and all the other cacao farmers, you know, to continue to, you know, to grow, to expand their cacao farms, because there is definitely, you know, great opportunity for them. But as you rightfully mentioned, it's not limited only to cacao. We are seeing, you know, the rice industry. We saw the rice industry, you know, reviving for the first time. You know, we saw a lot of farmers actually getting back into planting rice, particularly the subsistence farmers. You know, uh, we saw an increase, uh, you know, production. Uh, our Ministry of Rural, you know, Transformation, along with the Ministry of Infrastructure Development, also provided support to our farmers to be able to, you know, bring out their products. In many instances, you know, we have gone in and we have provided support to upgrade the farmers' roads. There is still a lot of work that has to be done in that regard with regards to infrastructure. Uh, we have seen, you know, the turmeric industry, you know, you know, continue to, you know, play a very important role. We're now seeing, you know, mm -hmm. turmeric products are also being exported. You know, the cardamom, you know, is mm -hmm. also a very, very important mm -hmm. product. We're seeing a lot of farmers, you know, in the southwestern part of the district, particularly in Halakte, in San Vicente, Pueblo Vio, San Benito, Poite, and some other areas where, you know, we have also seen increased production. You know, we have seen, you know, cattle you know, being exported, you know, certainly, you know, to Mexico. There is a rebounding, you know, of the economy. Mm -hmm. We have seen, you know, a revitalizing of the agricultural sector. 
And we're very happy because Ernesto, to be honest, if it was not for the agricultural sector, our country would be in serious problems, you know, uh, in relation to all the challenges and the difficulties that we have faced as a nation because of COVID-19. So, you know, I always believe that agriculture is the way to go. And, you know, our government is putting a lot of emphasis on, you know, agriculture and supporting our farmers. Minister Oscar Ricania also holds the portfolio for rural development. In this aspect, he explained that the government is looking to reform several areas, including the water boards that have been too politically motivated. When you look at the problems we encountered when we took over the rural water system uh, department, many challenges. Many water systems were non-functional. Uh, you know, we had systems where, you know, they would very huge electrical bills because they were, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mismanaged. Mm -hmm. uh, we also found problems where, you know, sometimes in communities, one person was running the board without any accountability. So we have gone into these uh, communities. We have a total of 108 water boards. 108 water boards. 108 water boards serving, I believe, 132 communities across the country. That means not all villages have water boards. No, not all, oh. because we do have some rural areas that are serviced by BWS. We have okay. to remember that. Okay. Yes, we have to remember yeah. that. So certainly we have gone in, and um, one of the first priorities was to ensure that, you know, we put in place proper water boards that, you know, we provided the necessary training so that they can, you know, manage these systems properly. Because one of the greatest challenges has just been the management of these systems. We, our goal is to ensure that we make these systems self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. We have seen that for too long, Ernesto, every time something goes bad, a water pump goes bad, you know, mm -hmm. pipes are broken or they have to pay a bill to, you know, Belize Electricity Limited. A lot of times, you know, these water boards want to rely on the government. That was never the intention. The intention was to create a system that is self-sustainable, right. that is managed by the residents, that they can provide a service, that they can, you know, ensure that they meet their bills and that they can also save money so that if something mm -hmm. goes wrong with their mm -hmm. system, that they can be responsible to ensure that it is up and running. Minister Rakenia further explained that there were several instances where the ministry had to urgently intervene in order for the residents to have access to water. For the most part, we have had to step in. And I can readily relate to many systems, uh, you know, that we have had to step, step up to and, and support Ernesto. I can readily think of, for instance, you know, Sarteneha, which, you know, was giving a lot of problems when we took over. And we had to go well, in. That's we, a big village. It I mean, is a very big village. We had to go in there. We had to find substantial, uh, you know, um, financial support to be able to get them up and running. And today it's up and running. I can really readily think, for example, of, you know, Shurush, you know, where they were having serious problems as well. And we continue to work with them, you know, and many other systems across the country. In San Antonio, Toledo, for example, you know, uh, there was a serious problem with the water system there. We had to go in. We drilled four wells. Uh, we couldn't find water. Fortunately, in the fifth well, we were able to get water. We have now constructed. So we have a new well. We have constructed a pump house. Uh, the, we, you know, we have, uh, you know, all the pipes and meters because we are going to rehabilitate the entire system, you know. We are waiting right now for a pump that we have ordered out of the country, and that is the delay. But very soon, we are going to have the water up and running in San Antonio. Love News understands that an audit had recently showed the water boards countrywide owing a quarter million dollars to the Belize Electricity Limited. An upset is in the making as residents in Barranco have received information of licenses being issued for logging in the village. Senior correspondent Paul Mahong has been looking into the issue and did speak with Chairman Jerry Arzu. Well, um, right now the logging has not started as such. Um, we're supposed to have a meeting on Sunday. I'm going to have a meeting on Sunday. But the issue is that, um, you know, I think some people are trying to take it out of proportion because they feel like that uh, members of the community did not get any... Um, Concession, but there are members of the community that sure did get concession, no? you know, along with other people from, from town, no? It will, it will be eventually because life has been granted to a couple of people from town and a couple of people from Barango. Okay. You know, just a, a few of the people who applied didn't get it, but in a great storm, no? Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Just keep it up, please. I really sorry about it.
Coming up after the break, we'll bring you the latest COVID-19 figures and police have made progress in the murder of Karina Andrews. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. and medium enterprises or SMEs in tourism are invited to submit proposals for financial incentives under the Matching Grant Program or MGP. The MGP is an activity under the Sustainable Tourism Program which provides funding to support projects that are beneficial to tourism including COVID prevention, environmental, skills development, technology investment, marketing or economic development. Targeted sectors include accommodation, food and beverage, transportation, travel trade, events and conferences, adventure and attractions, tourism services, tourism education and training, and other tourism-related services. Interested SMEs must complete and submit the required expression of interest forms for assessment and eligibility by February 21 at 4 p.m. Submit your expression of interest today. For more information, WhatsApp 67 Grant or 6747268. Email grants.unit at the least tourism board.org. Knowledge of the past, impacting the present, 
building the future. Join Rene Villanueva Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on Love FM and Love Television for Belize Watch. Find out more about the history and beauty of Belize as well as meet Belizeans who continue to build our nation in their unique way. Young entrepreneurs making their mark. Business people embracing new technology to face new challenges. Highlighting cultural traditions and outstanding Belizeans. Belize Watch. Catch the show Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on Love FM and Love Television with repeats on Sundays at 3 p.m. on Love Television. Do you have someone or something you want featured on our show? Call us at 2800707 or email BelizeWatch21 at gmail.com. Belize Watch. Knowledge of the past. Impacting the present. Building the future. Say thank you to our more partners. These are the b and &E Charitable Trust, working in the development of Belize by inspiring young Belizean entrepreneurs to dream and to dream big. The National Gas Company, fueling Belize forward. The National Gas Company, making sure that you not only have a guaranteed supply of gas for every household need, but also that it is of the highest quality at all times. Shell Belize has been fueling Belize for many, many years and have done so reliably and with a lot of dependability. Dibari stores in Belize City, Belmopan, San Ignacio, Orange Walk Tongue, and San Pedro and Burgess offering you much more for much less. Applying for a Social Security Sickness Benefit? Here's what you need to know. A complete claims package include one, sickness claim form fully completed by the claimant and medical doctor. Two, salaries record form completed by the employer or HR representative. Three, proof of bank account such as bank book, online banking, or statement displaying your name and account number. To submit via email, you need to take a clear photo or scan of the documents and email to claims at socialsecurity.org.bz. Be sure to include your full name, social security number, and benefit type in the subject line of the email. Or you can drop off all completed forms into the Dropbox slot at the nearest branch office. Deadline to submit is 14 days from your first day of illness. All forms are available on the website at www.socialsecurity.org.bz. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. The National Gas Company Limited was born of the need for the country of Belize to have a marine gas terminal of its own, thereby securing supplies of critical cooking gas for a growing population. As Belize's population grew, the time came for a modern marine gas terminal that ensured safety, security of supply, and the requisite infrastructure for industry-accepted quality assurance now demanded by the people of Belize. In 2020, the National Gas Company Limited became a reality. The National Gas Company Limited is a $60 million public-private partnership where Belize's private sector will design, finance, construct and manage a state-of-the-art national marine terminal facility and two complementary storage depots away from the coast. After 15 years, the National Gas Company will be fully turned over to the country and people of Belize at no cost to the taxpayer. The National Gas Company of Belize, fueling Belize forward. Welcome back. This is Love Live at 6. Data released by the Ministry of Health and Wellness shows that 135 new COVID cases were confirmed today. This puts the number of active cases at 3,000. 181 while there were 492 recoveries the number of persons under investigation is at 134 the good news tonight is that there were no deaths which leaves the total number of covid 19 deaths at 632 while the covid 19 infections are steadily decreasing the ministry of health and wellness is advising the public to continue wearing their face masks properly 
A teen from the Kaya district has been formally arrested and charged for the Saturday night murder of 20-year-old Karina Andrews. He is 19-year-old Jahim Lopez, a resident of Roaring Creek Village. Lopez allegedly followed the victims from a nightclub in Belmopan and fired as many as 15 shots in their direction as they approached a speed bump on the Hummingbird Highway. The incident claimed Andrew's life and injured three others who were also inside the vehicle. Digi and the Belize Electricity Limited, BEL, have issued a release surrounding the death of Edwin Shaw. Shaw is a technician attached to Digi who lost his life yesterday afternoon when he fell from a lamp post he was working on. The release reads, quote, Initial information shared indicates that Edwin fell from a BEL pole while executing his duties in Warring Creek Village in the Cayo District. Digi, BEL, and all relevant authorities are currently conducting a thorough investigation into this unfortunate incident. This is undeniably a horrible incident that has never occurred before. Edwin joined the company in January 2017 and was currently employed as a service operations and maintenance technician. In the Consumer Sales and Service Operations West Department in our commercial division, end of quote. The incident occurred just before 3 o'clock on Monday evening when the post show was mounted on, reportedly snapped in two, triggering the technician's fall. Show is from the Toledo District. We understand that he was a well-known Mayan parandero in his community. A Belize City resident who was charged for the October 2018 murder of 49-year-old Elroy Saldano pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter in the Supreme Court. 22-year-old Stefan Bowen appeared in court yesterday before newly appointed Judge Justice Ricardo Sancroft and pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter on the, uh, on the advice of his attorney, Oscar Salgado. His sentencing hearing was then set for March 30, 2022. Bowen, who was 19 at the time when he was charged, is accused of shooting Saldano as he rode his bicycle on Peter Seco Street in Belize City. Saldano had been shot twice in the back and died in the hospital eight days after the incident due to organ failure from the gunshot injuries he sustained. The prosecution had secured video evidence from a surveillance camera in the area of the shooting that caught Bowen shooting Soldano and then running off. Officials of the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs continued free prior informed consent protocol, FPIC, meetings with the Maya community of Southern Belize over the weekend. Senior correspondent Paul Mahong interviewed the Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Dolores Valderamas Garcia, who explained further. We are very, very pleased to be coming to the conclusion of a three-day working visit here in Toledo. And we have now just concluded at the sports complex a meeting with the leaders of several communities and in addition um, representatives from the Kekchi Council of Belize as well as Satim. We are extremely pleased that we are now promulgating and and making people know about the FPIC protocol that has been approved and also filed with the Caribbean Court of Justice. And our government is absolutely committed to an outreach throughout the Toledo district to all the villages. And we are starting that public relations campaign. Um, so we're very, very happy about the FPIC and um, we intend to consult widely so that people can know more about it because of government's commitment. I am not here to tell any tale against any individual or association, but I think that when we get out into the communities and we hear what the people actually have to say, that is where the truth of the situation will emerge and the government of Belize will not abdicate its authority. If there were individuals or a particular association who were claiming to be in control of the process, the news that I have today, with all respect to everyone, is that the government is now in control of the process. The FPIC protocol that was filed before the Caribbean Court of Justice is final, and that is the, the, the procedure and the policy that we will be following 
in respecting the customary land rights of the Maya people of the Toledo district. Valderramos Garcia further stated that the government is committed to holding additional meetings in other Maya villages with the leaders so that they get to know more about the FPIC protocol. My final word, let us work together. Let us not be unhelpful with incendiary language. Let us respect one another. Let us respect that the villagers within their villages are the decision-making um, um, authority. And if we understand that and can work with that, then I believe we will have a good result going forward. But I want to repeat government's commitment to continue our outreach. Minister Elvia Vega and myself will be going to many more of the Maya communities, especially as the dry season approaches, and we will listen. What is described as thousands of pieces of broken Maya ceramics was reportedly discovered a few days ago in Sartineha village, Corozoal. Jason Quintanilla told Love News that a couple of days ago, while on his way to the lagoon, he came across a clearing. He posted on Facebook saying that the thousands of broken pottery now litter the newly dirt road of the community that is presently being built adjacent to the Sartineha airstrip. Quintanilla pointed out that the Sartine, that Sartineha is home to several ancient Maya communities, but this site wasn't mapped out. In fact, the site was non-existent to the locals. With limited knowledge of the ancient Maya, Quintanilla proffered a theory. He hypothesized that no formal platform was visible. Probably they are still hidden in the nearby forest that this small community was built with perishable materials, leaving only the broken pottery as evidence of their existence. Quintanilla told of news that nevertheless, this tiny fraction of history is still valuable. As I was on my way to a, a lagoon behind the, um, the airport, I came across this, um, with this site. I wasn't aware of this place. Um, I believe it, none of the locals were aware, aware as well. In fact, it wasn't um, map, mapped out, so um, it, it was actually non-existent for us. The place was littered with hundreds and thousands of broken ceramics, and um, it was very um, disappointing to see those stuff. I believe they were all broken. They were in thousands and hundreds of pieces of them there. I believe they were all crushed and uh, destroyed by the heavy machines. They're actually building a new community adjacent to the airport, so um, there are lots of um, roads, and this one was still with the dirt road. It, ha it hasn't been filled with white lines, so it's still there. But in, in a couple months from now, I believe it's going to be filled as well. I'm not an, um, an expert in this, but I'm, I know a little about about the Maya, so I was able to um, come up with, with my, my own um, beliefs. And um, I believe that this place was, wasn't that big. It was probably like a leaf farming Maya community. Very small, but I'm um, but the artifacts are there, so it's evident that these people were living there. It's a lot, but um, at, by this time, they're all crushed into very tiny pieces. It's actually um, camouflaging with the dirt, and the, with the black dirt and the red dirt that we have back there. So it's a lot, though. Every ancient ancient community, I believe, is very val valuable, valuable. So it doesn't matter the size, it's still valuable and important. Our newsroom did try to reach the Institute of Archaeology, but our calls went unanswered. According to studies of reef sharks, even in protected areas, endangered sharks may still be vulnerable. Florida International University, FIU, researchers tracked the number of Caribbean reef sharks at Glover's Reef Atoll, World Heritage Site, which is a marine protected area, or an MPA in Belize. Monitoring was focused on the no-take zone where fishing is prohibited. The team documented a population decline from 2009 to 2019. The group made recommendations that led to a new legislation that was signed in June 2021. It prohibits shark fishing two nautical miles around Glover's Reef Atoll, Lighthouse Reef Atoll, and Turnif Atoll. FIU professor and Moat Marine Lab Director of Sharks and Rays Conservation Research explained how these conservation measures have impacted Belize's shark population. 
we're working with governments, and one example, and specifically this uh, grant is going to the government of, Bel we're working with the government of Belize, because they recently, over the summer, protected 1,500 square miles of coral reef so for great. sharks. So great. And uh, we thank you for that, because uh, the, what the government did is they actually brought together researchers, uh, fishermen and women uh, from Belize, and the, their government people, and they, they wanted to do something for shark conservation. Uh, so we all sort of worked together, looked at the science, came up with these protected areas. The crazy thing is the endangered camp campaign funding and funding from other sources helped us get the fishermen and women on board. The new regulations protect sharks as apex predators of the Belize Barrier Reef Reserve System. Kenneth Esquivel, Assistant Fisheries Officer at the Fisheries Department, highlighted additional measures taken to safeguard the shark population. What we have, though, are pro-season, which with this new regulation that were passed last year, we extended the shark fishing season before it was from August to October. Um, when they, with these new regulations, now we extend it from the 1st of May to the 31st of October. So we now have a longer close season where we allow sharks to, to mature. There's various penalties that are put in place, there are fines um, for fishermen who are caught with sharks within the no-take zone, um, who are also found with um, hooks. Um, that are not the correct size as stipulated in the regulation. Um, so there are some there there, um, there are some fines being imposed um, when caught with illegal sharks in the areas or with during the close season. Caribbean reef sharks are listed as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species. Research by FIU shows they are also one of the most fished shark species in Belize. Chapman explained that if sharks are eliminated from the marine food chain, it could lead to an unhealthy ocean. The Fisheries Department is hoping that the new regulations will see an increase in shark numbers by the end of this year. The ban on single-use plastic products will be enforced by the end of this month. The importation of these plastics, as defined in the regulations, has been strictly prohibited since April 15 of last year. Reporter Giovanna Mogel spoke with businesses in Belize City to document how this change will affect them. Here is her report. The Department of the Environment within the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management informed the public that the Environmental Protection Pollution from Plastics Regulations were recently amended with the passing of Statutory Instrument No. 17 of 2022. The SI stated that commencing February 28, 2022, the amended regulations will be enforced. A representative from JNW Supermarket in Kings Park explained how these regulations has affected their business. Well, the price, number one, the price. A lot of customers complain about the prices that before, well, it went up higher, you know, now. And, uh, they Could you give a comparison of what it used to be as opposed to right now? Well, before, like this one, we had... This for like one ninety nine, and now it's at two eighty five. For the same amount. Yeah, same amount actually. Yeah. Have you seen a decrease in customers purchasing these products here because of the price? Well, actually, it sells, you know, because that they they need it, so it's they have to to purchase it either way. Restauranteurs are also facing challenges as a result of these implementations. As we know, due to COVID-19 regulations, restaurants can only host up to 70% capacity. This means that the amount of takeout orders have increased since pre-COVID times. President of the Belizean Chinese Association, Johnson Au, highlighted how Chinese businesses will be affected by this change. This new uh, regulation, first of all, uh, it helps because, because for the business. And that was going to reflect in, a, in the prices. And then the Chinese community will get the blame with all these people hyping up this topic with price gouging and a whole lot. But uh, it's not, people, many don't understand that it's not because of the business, 
care of your prices. It's just like the expansion goes up. So I hope the, the general public, they, they, they understand this part. This new regulation that well, the Chinese community is no have no problem to to to, to um, apply all of this and to follow the new regulation. The Department of the Environment, along with the Belize Bureau of Standards, will continue to monitor and enforce the environmental protection pollution from plastics regulations as amended in January 2022. Reporting for Love News, I am Giovanna Mogel. And there's more news ahead when we return. You're watching Love Life at 6. How to register for an account online. Welcome to Iris Belize online portal user registration. This guide will provide a step-by-step -step on how to register your account on the Iris Belize portal. On the home page, click the register for an account button. This link will take you to the online registration form. Start filling the following details. Your first and last name, your date of birth. Enter your name and date of birth as given on your social security card or birth certificate. Your mobile number. This will be used for request verification and important communication from Belize Tax Service. Your email address. This email address will be used to log in to the portal. Enter a password as per the specifications given. Reconfirm your password. This should be the same as the password field above. Enter the appropriate security answers to the three questions. Note, these questions will be used in the event you need to recover your password and validate your identity. When finished, check the read and agree box for the terms and conditions and privacy policy. Now, you can click the submit my registration button. Your user account registration has been sent. A confirmation email will be sent to the email address you entered. Open the email and click the Confirm Email Address button. You are now registered. For the final step, you will need to contact Belize Tax Service to link your tax account to your online profile. This process will take approximately 24 hours to link. Enjoy using your integrated revenue information system. Effortless, easy, electronic, efficient processing of taxes for everyone. Iris Belize. Register now for the Belekin La Ruta Maya Belize River Challenge. For registration info, contact 621-1955. The Belekin La Ruta Maya Belize River Challenge. March 4 to March 7. It's more than just a race. Partners of the Belican La Ruta Maya Belize River Challenge are Beacol, eCash powered by Belize Bank, Niche, Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Sol, Honorable Rodwell Ferguson, the Department of Transport Belize, and the National Sports Council of Belize, Embassy of the Republic of China on Taiwan, Ayinha, BTB, Belican, and Motor Solutions. Know the warning signs of kidney disease. 90% of people with kidney disease don't know they have it. Know the warning signs. 1. Blood in your urine. Sign number 2. Dark brown urine. 3. High blood pressure. 4. Difficulty breathing or sleeping. 5. Dry and itchy skin. 6. Urinate more often than usual. 7. Persistent puffiness around your eyes. 8. Swollen ankles or feet. 9. Poor or loss of appetite. Don't panic if you have one or more of these warning signs. See a doctor immediately. Kidney disease can be successfully treated. 
Brought to you by the Sunrise Rotary Club of Belize, the Love Foundation, and the Kidney Association of Belize. For more information, please visit www.niddk.nih.gov slash information slash kidney disease. Notice to all employers and employees. The Director General hereby notifies employers that the due date for the filing of TD4 summary and supplementary for 2021 is Monday the 28th of February 2022. Employers are required to attach to the TD4 summary a payer econ template including all employees, whether taxable or non-taxable. The template labeled Payer Econ along with TD4 requirements can be found on our website at www.bts.gov.bz. The due date for the filing of individual employees' income tax returns for the basis year 2021 is Thursday the 31st of March 2021. Claims for refund must be accompanied by a copy of the Social Security Card and banking information. The BTSD takes this opportunity to invite employees to register and utilize the Iris Belize online portal to file their employee returns for 2021. Visit our website at www.bts.gov.bz and view the tutorial for creating your online account. Please do not hesitate to contact the Belize Tax Service Department if you have any questions or need for guidance. We thank you for your continued cooperation. A message from the Director General. Commercial Cleaning and Products of Belize, CTP, formerly known as Carpet Care Plus, offers a wide variety of professional restorative cleaning services and products in Belize. With over 20 years of experience in the industry, our mission has always been to provide our customers with the best products and services for quality, safe, and environmentally friendly cleaning. What separates us from the rest? The services we offer. Fabric cleaning for all types of carpets, upholstery, walls, and drapes. Vehicle detailing for both the interior and exterior. Total restorative cleaning of ceramic and porcelain tiles for floors, walls, marble, granite, limestone, travertine, clay, and more. Degreasing and polishing of the entire kitchen and all its equipment. Also, custom concrete design. We are a supplier of the most cost-efficient and economically viable products when you buy our specialized super-concentrated formulas, such as cleaners, disinfectants, deodorizers, and sanitizers. Additionally, we also carry professional cleaning equipment, such as mops, buckets, vacuums, doormats, and window equipment, which are very durable and practical. You can order any of our products online at www.ccpbelize.com. CCP Belize uses only trained technicians, professional commercialized equipment, and EPA certified products. Our products are 100% biodegradable. We also have certified green products, which are used by Green Globe approved companies. Visit us at 68 North Front Street, Belize City, or contact us at telephone 223-1820. Email us info at ccpbelize.com. Are you planning to start a garden? Does your car need to be clean? Don't worry, the Life Skills Multipurpose Group got you covered. If you don't have a car to watch, the Life Skills Multipurpose Group has cars on sale at very affordable prices. We also have cement blocks on sale with skilled masons and carpenters ready to do that driveway, fence, or demolition. But wait, there's more. We also have reliable plumbers waiting for your call because no job is too big or too small for us. So call us at 614-4596 or visit us at 12 Caesar Ridge Road, Belize City, near the port of Belize. Every business is powered by their people. You can help improve the work experience for all your employees with the cloud-based solution Neo People. Neo People puts you in easy command of all your employee core people functions like payroll, benefits, leave management, document management, and employee data. 
giving you the tools you need to manage your workforce from recruitment to retirement. Visit our website at neopeople.bz. Success is often as a result of hard work and unlimited enthusiasm. We did everything with people in mind. To uplift, inspire, and inform Belize and Belizeans. And to educate and empower the nation, one community at a time. Service to our people is paramount. Love FM. 29 years of dependability and commitment to excellence for Belize and Belizeans. An enthusiasm for improved service delivery. A spirit of community development using modern technology. Belize and beyond. Thanks for choosing love. Belize Watch. Knowledge of the past. Impacting the present. Building the future. Join Rene Villanueva Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on Love FM and Love Television for Belize Watch. Find out more about the history and beauty of Belize, as well as meet Belizeans who continue to build our nation in their unique way. Young entrepreneurs making their mark. Business people embracing new technology to face new challenges. Highlighting cultural traditions and outstanding Belizeans. Belize Watch. Catch the show Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on Love FM and Love Television, which repeats on Sundays at 3 p.m. on Love Television. Do you have someone or something you want featured on our show? Call us at 280-0707 or email BelizeWatch21 at gmail.com. Belize Watch, knowledge of the past, impacting the present, building the future. Say thank you to our more partners. These are the b &E Charitable Trust, working in the development of Belize by inspiring young Belizean entrepreneurs to dream and to dream big. The National Gas Company, fueling Belize forward. The National Gas Company, making sure that you not only have a guaranteed supply of gas for every household need, but also that it is of the highest quality at all times. Shell Belize has been fueling Belize for many, many years and have done so reliably and with a lot of dependability. Dibari stores in Belize City, Belmopan, San Ignacio, Orange Walk Town, and San Pedro and Burgris offering you much more for much less. And welcome back to our final segment of news for tonight. The Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry, BCCI, continues to show appreciation to public health nurses countrywide. Today, Executive Member Jody Williams, as part of BCCI's Nurse Give Back program, handed over 97 boxes filled with groceries, snacks, and healthcare products for healthcare workers in the front line in Dangriga and Independence Villages. The nursing administrator at the Southern Regional Hospital, Jersha Lennon, spoke to Love News. We just want to thank the Belize Chamber of Commerce for giving back to nurses. This is their way of expressing their appreciation and thanks to nurses throughout the country for their service, especially in this pandemic. And so they have prepared us a, a box with gifts of whatever is it that the company was able to gather to, to donate to us. So these will be used by the nurses for, the, for their personal upliftment, for their family, for their homes. And the boxes um, were given to individualized nurses. And there was also a, a gift package, a, a card from the, that from the Jeanette as well, all right, that um, the nurses can use for their personal use during this time. So we are most grateful and most thankful for this wonderful gift that they have rendered to us. BCCI's Nurse Give Back program continues this week. 
The official program of events for the State Memorial for former Prime Minister Sir Manuel Esquivel began this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Sir Manuel was cremated last week and today the urn containing his remains was taken to the former state dining room at the government house for a state memorial. The event was exclusive to invited guests who fil filed into the dining room with from 2 to 4 o'clock this afternoon to pay their respect. The event was broadcast live on this station and Ippolito Novello provides a recap. State Memorial celebrating the life of Right Honorable Dr. Sir Manuel Esquivel was held today in Belize City. The urn containing the remains of the two times former Prime Minister and UDP leader departed from Sir Manuel's home on Daly Street en route to the government house where it will lie in state. The urn was placed in a glass case with a wooden frame and a shrunken size of the Belize flag on it. Belizeans stood on the street side as the urn traveled to the government house on Regent Street, carefully taken by a corps of officers tasked with specific responsibilities. The funeral director is Warrant Officer Class 2 Delton Morgan, the regimental, regimental Sergeant Major for 1st Infantry Battalion. The earned party commander is Major Ruben Cowell. Es escorts to the urn are Captain Jairo Che and Captain Galen Robato. And there's a cushion escort, Captain Adrian Bosch. And then the following, um, and, uh, in addition to that, the sword party commander is Captain Elmer Moore. The firing party commander, Staff Sergeant Glenstone Palacio. The aide de camp for the chief mourner, as I mentioned at the top, is Major Megan Aspinall. And uh, the state memorial is being facilitated by the Force Sergeant Major Warrant Officer Class 1, Wilfredo Mahano, who is a graduate of the NCO Leadership of Excellence and Sergeant Major Academy. The pragmatic politician became the country's leader in 1984 when he led the United Democratic Party to victory in the general elections against the People's United Party. He did so again in 1993. He was bestowed the title Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George with the cordage. Dion was then taken into the government house to lie in state, guarded by soldiers and for persons to pay their respects. The first was Chief Mourner and Sir Manuel's wife, Cathy, and the Esquivel family. And throughout the evening, persons did pay their respects, including Prime Minister John Bersini, who greeted Cathy and spoke to her for a couple of minutes. Other invited guests included Acting Chief Justice Madame Michelle Arana, Opposition Leader Moses Shine Barrow, Union Senator Elena Smith, Belize City Mayor Bernard Wagner and former UDP Minister Michael Finnegan, who was very close to Sir Manuel. Oh, my family and the people I love closely, I want to say that we love the earth you walk on. Goodbye, my friend. Reporting for Love News, Hippolyta Novello. Belize's national women's football team in El Salvador, they are in El Salvador, to participate in the CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers. The team left the country on Monday and will face off with El Salvador's team in San Salvador on Wednesday afternoon. The team has been training since last month and is playing in Group D. Two of the players, Jada Brown and Ashley Rodriguez, say they are prepared for victory. I am pretty confident. I uh, have been training during the COVID break and just preparing for a moment like this and especially to represent my country and to be able to make history. I know that this is the CONCACAF qualifiers for women. Um, tell me, how do you feel as a woman footballer representing the entire country? Like, is it a lot of pressure or are you excited? Talk to me about that. I am pretty excited. Um, breaking barriers showing that female does have uh, the capability to, to play football and be able to show young girls that they are um, able to, to represent our country. Not only males have the ability, but also females and we have power as well. The preparations have went well and I really expect that we, all our work, hard work put in the preparations, bring us a uh, great outcome on our game the 16th of February. Okay, and how um, are you feeling about the game nervous? Well, I won't say I'm not nervous because I do get nervous before I go and play a game, but I hope that by tomorrow my nervousness goes down and then I'll be more mentally prepared. 
Head coach Wayne Casemiro says that while some players were not able to make the game due to COVID, the team remains strong and committed to perform its best. I think we have done um, as much as we have we could given the situation with the pandemic, and I, we've we've done the physical aspect of the of the game, the tactical aspect, and I think the girls are, are prepared and ready to step on the pitch and play. It. And to represent Belize well. And as the coach for the senior women's team, what is one message that you always share with them? Ah, that we keep getting better uh, no matter where we are. We have to be positive in what we do. And when we step out of our country, it's to represent Belize and to be proud of what we do. We have just done some studies on, based on previous games that El Salvador has uh, played uh, with the, in the friendlies that they have done. Um, so that's basically what we're doing, just video analysis of, of the little things that we've seen that they have played. And for us, we are here to compete, ready to participate in the group, and the aim is to, to qualify from, from the group. Some of our players that uh, were to, to be here aren't because of uh, contracting COVID. So for us, that would have been, that would be our biggest obstacle in, in terms of um, what would I call a, a setback for us? Because outside of that, um, we have prayer. The game is played on the pitch, and for, for me to be able to pray on that would, would, be, uh, would be a bad thing. So for, for, for me, we are ready to step on the pitch. It's 11 versus 11, and I don't see setbacks. For us, it's just COVID for me. We are ready to be on the pitch and, and to play. We were in camp uh, prior to coming here, and we, we did the, the basic elements that that encompasses football, which is the tactical, technical, the, the sociological aspects of, of the game and to ensure that our players are, are ready and understand what they are to do on the pitch. So we, we, we were in camp prior to coming here, so we're set. The team's second match will be on Sunday against Panama in Belmopan. Thereafter, the team will go against Aruba on April 6th, also in Belmopan, and later on April 12th against Barbados in Bridgetown. And this has been Love Live at 6. I am Tamar Jones. Remember that for transcripts of tonight's stories, you can log on to lovefm.com. We'll be back here tomorrow with more news. Until then, have a good night. Good evening, Belize. A cool and moist northerly air flow prevailing, but drier and warmer conditions can be expected by tomorrow. The 24-hour forecast for Belize and her coastal waters calls for mostly cloudy skies tonight with low temperatures of 68 degrees Fahrenheit along the coast to 66 inland and 60 in the higher elevations. Tomorrow will be cloudy with sunny breaks and high temperatures will range from 84 degrees Fahrenheit along the coast to 86 inland and 72 in the mountains. A few showers and periods of light rain will continue to develop mainly along central and northern coasts and over inland areas tonight and tomorrow morning. Then by afternoon, showers will become isolated. The winds will blow from the north to northeast at 10 to 20 knots and the sea state will be moderate. A high tide will occur at 9.26 tonight, followed by a low at 4.38 a.m. Another high occurs at 10.29 a.m. and a low at 3.54 in the afternoon. The sun will rise at 18 minutes past 6 tomorrow morning and set at 5.54 p.m. The moon will set at 6.27 tomorrow morning and comes up again at 8 minutes past 6 in the evening. The outlook for Wednesday night through to Thursday is for generally fair weather to prevail with only isolated showers. And that's your evening forecast that was prepared here at the National Meteorological Service.